Time for Tartarian Tales number 26, where we're going to talk about the Great Wall of China, Pinto and his adventures there, and the knowledge he receives on this topic. Just a little bit more insight gained here. There's a lot of insight that needs to be discovered about the Great Wall and its true origins because there is no way that humans our size built that. It would have taken millennia, maybe millions of years. Something else had to have built it and it had to have a different purpose and it must go underneath those mountains. There must be way more left to be uncovered. So the more insight we can get into this, the better. But let's see what Pinto has to offer here. Chapter 95, The Great Wall of China. As long as I have dealt with the origin and the founding of the Chinese Empire in the walls of the great city of Peking, I thought it would also be fitting to add, as briefly as possible, a few words about something else no less remarkable than each of the others. One reads in the fifth volume of the Guide to All Notable Places, in the Empire or mon Monarchy, or however one chooses to call it, for really any word signifying greatness is appropriate when referring to it, that in the year AD 528, which seems to be the right date, based on the Book of Eras they use, the ruling king named Krishnagal Dakote went to war against the Tartar because of a dispute they had over the state of Zheng Napao, which borders in the interior with the kingdom of Laos, routing his forces and achieving a resounding victory in the field. However, immediately afterwards, the Tartar began to gather a still larger and more powerful army than before. By entering into an alliance in league with some other kings who were friendly to him, and eight years later he invaded China again, capturing, it is affirmed, 32 important towns, including the large city of Pongkilor, and, out of fear that he would not be able to defend himself against him, the Chinese king signed a peace treaty with him, under the terms of which he agreed to relinquish his rights to the disputed territory and, in addition, to hand over the sum of 2,000 silver pickles to pay for the foreign mercenaries in the Tartar's army. That settled the matter, and everything was peaceful and quiet for the next 52 years, as it says in the same history book. However, since he was afraid that he might not be able to resist the combined force of another confederation similar to the last, the reigning Chinese king decided to build a wall, sealing off the entire frontier between the two empires. He convoked a general assembly of the people and informed them of what he had decided, and they all thought it was an essential and highly desirable thing to do. To help meet the cost of such an important project, they voted him the sum of 10,000 silver pickles which in our currency is equal to 15 million gold cruzados, calculated at the rate of 1,500 cruzados per pickle. And in addition, it is said that they voted to maintain for as long as it took a workforce of 250,000 consisting of 30,000 trained engineers and the rest unskilled laborers. After assembling everything necessary for this extraordinary project, they got to work. And the history relates that within a period of 27 years, the borders of these two empires were completely sealed off from one end to the other. This would mean, going by what it says in the same chronicle, that the wall extended for a distance of 70 jows, which is the equivalent of 315 leagues by our reckoning, calculating at four and a half leagues per jow. They say that 750,000 men worked continuously on this project to which the common people, as I said before, contributed a one-third share of the cost, the priesthood in the Hainine Islands, another third, and the king, together with the princes, the lords, and the Chayans, and Enchasis, in high governing positions, contributed the remaining third. This wall, which I saw a few times and which I measured, is on the average six arm spans tall and forty hand spans wide in the masonry work. But from four arm spans down, there slopes a dirt and rubble fill like terraplane, braced on the outside face with a bituminous substance like mortar, nearly twice as wide as the wall itself, making it all so strong that not even a thousand basilisks could knock it down. And instead of towers or bastions, it has some two-story lookouts erected on heavy timber piles of a black wood they call cobbacy, meaning iron wood each one as thick as a wine barrel and very tall, as a result of which these lookouts, it seems, turn out to be much stronger than if they had been made of stone and lime. This wall, or Chanfasau, as they call it, runs along like this uniformly until it meets the rough terrain of the mountains that appear along the way, which, in order that they may also serve as part of the wall, 
are all smoothed down and sloped with pickaxes, making these sections much stronger than the very wall itself. This means that in all this distance of land, the only wall there is that which occupies the space between the mountains, and in all the rest, the mountains themselves serve as part of the wall. And in the entire length of this wall, along all these 315 leagues, there are only five entrances formed by the rivers of Tartary, which descend with tremendous force, cutting across the interior for a distance of more than 500 leagues before emptying into the seas of China, in Cochin, China. And one of these rivers, since it is more powerful than the others, finds its outlet in the kingdom of Sornau, commonly known as Siam, at the bar city of Kui. And both the Chinese king and the Tartar have troops stationed at all five entrances, and at each one the Chinese has a garrison of 7,000 men posted around the clock, consisting of 6,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalrymen, who receive very high wages. And most of them are foreigners, such as Mughals, Pankrus, Chams, Khorasanis, Jizaris from Persia, and others recruited from many other nations in kingdoms located in the heart of the interior, because the truth is that the Chinese do not really make very good soldiers, for aside from their lack of experience in warfare, they are faint-hearted, a little short of firearms, and totally lacking in heavily, heavy artillery. Altogether, there are 320 command posts along the entire wall, with a 500-man company stationed at each, making a total of 160,000 men, not counting the administrators, magistrates, and yupos guarding the anchasis and chams, and many other people who are necessary for running the wheels of government and for sustaining this huge population, which altogether, the Chinese told us, came to 200,000 men who were constantly on duty and whose subsistence was the only expense borne by the king. For since all, or almost all of them, are conscripts, condemned to forced labor, they do not have to give them wages, just their food, as I will explain later when I discuss the prison located in the city of Peking, where these conscripts are held, which also happens to be another outstanding building of remarkable architectural grandeur and proportions. Within its walls, there is a constant labor pool of over 300,000 prisoners, all or most of them ranging in age from 18 to 45, who are kept there in readiness, waiting to be called out to work on this great wall. Among them, there are many highly respected members of the nobility and wealthy upper class who had committed serious crimes but who had, this, had the sentences they deserved commuted to serving what amounts to a life term at this forced labor prison where they remain. Waiting to be called out to work on the wall, while they are there, they have recourse to appeal as provided by the statutes of war enacted for that purpose and approved by the chains who enjoy the same unlimited privileges and powers of life and death as does the king himself in these and all other matters. In every single one of these 12 high-ranking chains in government service has the right to dispense funds, even as much as a million crusados in gold from the public treasury if he chooses to, with no one to say him nay. So very interesting. It kind of seems like a lot like the government they have now, where they use prisoners. I'm not sure why they'd have so many back then, but you never know, I guess. But where they use prisoners for their own profit, benefit. You know, back then they used it for the wall. Now they use it for medical and organ harvesting and probably a lot more that we have no idea about. Slave labor, work, all different kind of things. Pretty interesting how some things like this never change. And again, I'm always skeptical about the origins. I really don't think people could have done this. Uh, maybe in our, maybe that many people, maybe I think it would take more and more time than 27 years. And I still think it's something more magical that's just ancient and been lost to time. But who knows? It is cool to hear how they had so many people stationed there protecting what and from whom, I wonder. This is the end of the wall. We're back in these, when these pictures were taken, an American put a flag there, of course. <laughs> well, bless you all. More Tartarian Tales to come.